So now in uh, numerical method, we start a new section, random number generation. Of course, uh, it's still related to our Monte Carlo method. So it's now the building block. How do we generate the sequence capital X, capital XI of IID random variables evaluated on a specific event. So that is now the sequence little xi, it's the random number sequence. So let's start with the pseudo random number generators that you maybe already know, yeah, they are built in your computer. Uh, and the term pseudo random number is maybe not very, very strict. Yeah? So what does it mean? So it's an algorithm that generates a sequence, but the sequence is very hard to predict. So in theory, maybe the sequence could be predicted because it's just an algorithm, but it's very hard. And this very hard is maybe not precisely defined. There are some properties. Yeah? For example, if it is uniform between zero and one, you would expect that the expectation is 0 0.5. Yeah? And the variance also has a certain property and that if you check these properties that they hold, but um, okay, this, this term very hard is maybe not um, precise. And there are different algorithms that have different properties. Yeah? And so maybe also different quality with respect to the numbers. The most prominent example is the linear concurrential generator. So a linear concurrential generator is a classic random number generator. And you already maybe know a little bit this idea because um, what we do is we generate a sequence xi by just taking very basic integer arithmetic operations. So the xi is defined in terms of the previous one. So the next value is given as a function of the previous value. So the sequence just needs the previous value by multiplying that value with a constant a, adding some other constant. So that's just a linear function. Okay, why? how can that be random? You're just applying a linear function. And then taking the modulus m with some other integer. So what do we need as parameters, as ingredients? Of course, since the next value depends on the previous value, I need the starting point the initial point. So this guy is also sent sometimes called the seed. It's the starting point of the sequence. And if you use the same seed, then you get always the same sequence, of course. Uh, and then we have the other parameters, the A, the C and the M. Okay, so if you now remember modulus, okay, integer arithmetic, that is just what integer arithmetic would do anyway, maybe with a different M now. You can think of this as having your numbers set here out on this circle. So we start here with zero, one, two, three, and then modulus M means the largest number that can occur. It's the remainder in the division by M. The largest number that can occur is here an M minus one and then an M minus two. Okay. And then we have integer arithmetic that is going around this circle. So whenever your multiplication is much larger than M, yeah, larger or equal than M, you just take the remainder you know, of this. So you go round and round on this circle until you stop at some, 
some number. So that means we perform here this operation and the A and the C are now large numbers. They are so large that we will go around multiple times. So this is a little bit like a wheel of fortune. Where C is maybe some offset that you have at the end. And A is a little bit the velocity you know, with which you push the wheel. But however, the velocity also depends on the previous number. You know? Okay, so, and now if this is like a wheel of fortune, maybe that is really, really random. Yeah, if I just look at the remainder. So many built-in uh, generators are of this uh, form. Yeah, for example, also here, the Java util random is of this form. We can have a look at the code or as the documentation. And um, it uses an M being, two to the power of 48. So that means the integer number that we generate is an 84 bit number. Okay, so uh, maybe you, we use a 64 bit long integer to perform this operation. And then we take the modulus. So we uh, cut off to the 48 bits yeah, and use that as the next starting value. Of course, these generators are quite simple and they have some undesired properties. Okay, and I don't want to go too deep into this, but you can, for example, find um, the following result that if you use this generator to generate random numbers in higher dimensions, so I now generate a random number in D dimensions by just populating the vector one by the other. So you remember that this here is the rule that we had to generate a vector out of a sequence by just populating these, then you find that these higher dimensional points have a certain structure. So you find, for example, that the yi, which is now the point in D dimension, they only always lie uh, on just a finite set of hyper hyperplanes. So they all share some, some plane. And uh, this is M to the power of one divided by D, where D is the dimension. So if you, M is a very large number, yeah, two to the power of 48. But if you make the dimension very high, yeah, you only get very few planes. Yeah, So you see that, for example, in dimension 48, yeah, you will get that all the guys lie on a hyperplane. Yeah, you, you, you have some undesired properties, so you have to be a little bit uh, careful. So another popular um, random number generator is Mersenne and Twister, and I also use it a lot in the lecture. I already used it when we played with Monte Carlo integration. Um, it also generates, say, a bit sequence or an integer sequence, but when we use it, we use it as a generator that generates equidistributed, equidistributed random numbers on zero one. So you also find this sometimes under the name MT19937. Um, well, that's a strange name. And it relates to the period length. Okay, so what is the period length? If you go back here to our linear concurrential generator, then you see that he generates an integer number between zero and M minus one. So in addition, the next value only depends on the previous value. This means that 
when you encounter the same value again, the whole sequence will repeat. So it is periodic. And since I only generate a finite number of values, there are only m different values, I for sure know that this sequence will repeat at a certain point in time. So the length of this largest sequence where it does not repeat is called the period length. And the largest possible period length is of course M because once I have generated M numbers, the best case is that all the different M numbers are in the sequence. The next number has to be a number that had been occurred before, so the sequence will repeat. So clearly such a generator would have some periodic behavior. And we already know from this definition that the period length is at most M. So the period length of such a generator is at most M. So we know that after M numbers, the sequence repeats. The Mersenne twister now has a huge period length. So the previous one, the M was two to the power of 48. So the period length is at most two to the power of 48. This is the best possible case. And for this generator, I know that the period length is two to the power of 19,937 minus one. So this generator has a huge period length. So the sequence does not repeat. And also, if you look at higher dimensions, yeah, we already saw that um, with the hyperplane property, yeah, if you move to some reasonable high dimension, you can already get issues. Uh, it's known that this generator has good properties up to dimensions 600, 23, so quite high dimension. You can generate a sequence in a 623 dimensional space. Well, now you might be, okay, that's a really huge number. Yeah? There wouldn't be any application where I need such a high dimensional sequence. But when we do later Monte Carlo for stochastic processes, so random variables that depend on time, it will turn out that time, if you perform a time discretization, every time step, is a dimension yeah? because you have independent increments in the time. Every time step is a dimension. And then you can easily have 600 dimensions by taking just 100 time steps of six values. Okay, so it's important to have a generator that has these nice um, properties. So the Mersenne twister is not a linear concurrential generator, but it shares some uh, similarities. So for example, the previous guy, it worked on an integer. So you can think if the modulus M, it, if, if it is um, a smaller number, then it's maybe a 32 bit integer. Uh, you could also think of a larger integer. So for example, the Java util random works here on a 48 bit word, yeah, on a 48 bit integers because the M is equal to two to the power of 48. And the Mersenne twister operates on an integer that has 19,968 bits. So actually these are 624 32-bit integers. So actually he has a huge array and then in every iteration, this huge array is completely twisted. So my linear concurrential generator was a generator that generates an integer. So between zero and M minus one, if I take the modulus M. But in my Monte Carlo integration, I always need say a uniform distributed real value where I can transform the integral. So let's say between zero and one. So how do I generate now 
a uniform random number on zero one. Of course, if you have um, a generator that generates an integer, so now we have my integer x and the integer x is between zero included and m not included. So this is what my linear concurrential generator would do. Then I can just define now the random number that is on zero one by dividing this x by m. Yeah? So m is not included. So I get uh, this floating point number as a random number between zero and one. And this is already also done if you now look at the implementation. And let's have maybe a little bit closer look on how this works by looking at the implementation of the Java util random class, which I also sometimes use in my um, experiments. So I already mentioned that this guy has an M being a two to the power of 48. So I operate with 48 bits. And the bit sequence is given by this function next. So first let's maybe look at this function next. I have to find the web page. Yeah, so maybe that's nicer. Okay, so that's the documentation of this function. And uh, you see that it's the linear concurrential generator. So this here is the previous number. If it is the first request, it is the initial value, it is the seed. Then we multiply with a large number. So this is now the hex representation of this number. And then we add the constant C. And then we take modulus two to the power of 48. Well, actually this is just a one. And then I shift the bit by 48 shifts. Yeah? So every shift is a multiplication with two. So it's a, this here is just a two to the power of 48. And modulus means that I cut off all the other bits. So if I take a minus one, then these are all the bits from zero to 47 switched on. And I take the end. Yeah? So actually this is just the modulus. So throw away all the other bits. Um, from this uh, function, you can now request um, a certain subset of bits. So you see, you can add here an argument that you only would like to have 32 bits or you only would like to have 20 bits. So if you just would like to have an integer, you would like to have 32 bits. So this is actually also the max value because he just returns the integer. So that means he's also throwing away from these 48 bits that he's generating, he's throwing away a few bits. And which bits is he throwing away? So you see he's making here a shift of the bits to the right. So he's throwing away the lower bits. Yeah? So he just takes, takes uh, the higher bits. Okay, but apart from this thing with the bits, and maybe if you don't have understood it, it's not such a big issue. This is just the very simple mathematical formula that we had um, on the slide. So now if I would like to have a floating point number, I can use the next float method. And this floating point number takes from this um, generated integer number, so from this actually 48 bits where I throw some away, it takes 24 bits. So it takes a 24 bit integer. So I take now another special M, M is equal to two to the power of 24. And I just take an integer value between zero and M minus one. And then I just divide by two to the power of 24. So I just divide here by my M to create the number between zero and one. We can have a look at this two. 
So here's now the documentation of the next float. And you see that he's generating now an integer using 24 bits. So that was the function we just looked at. And then he's dividing by, okay, and that is just a two to the power of 24. He's dividing by two to the power of 24. Uh, okay, so now a small thing. If you remember how a normalized floating point number looks like, so the normalized floating point number, it's given by, okay, minus one to the power of S, one plus C divided by two to the power of P times two to the power of E. So that was our session on computer arithmetic. Well, with a P equals to 23. So recall here our definition of a floating point number and the float is using 23 bits. So the double was using 52 bits to represent this two to the power of P part, yeah? to represent the C. Okay, but I'm dividing here with a two to the power of 24. So now it's easy to show that if you divide this integer by two to the power of 24, then this corresponds to a floating point number without rounding. Okay, so why is that? Well, assume for example, that the X is a quite large number. So it is in the set two to the power of 23 and two to the power of 24 minus one. Okay, an integer number in this, in this set. Yeah? So then this means that the X is equal to two to the power of 23 plus a C. Okay, um, and the C is now um, in this range. So, and now if I take X divided by two to the power of 24, then this is one half plus C divided by two to the power of 24. Well, and this is the same as one plus C divided by two to the power of 23 times one half. So two to the power of minus one. So this means that I have an E of minus one and I have the C and the P is here the 23, right? So you see that actually um, an integer in this interval here, interval, in, in, integer in this interval divided by two to the power of 24 gives me exactly a floating point number in this representation. And now you can go on to all the smaller intervals. Well, having here 22 and 23, and we'll just make this guy here smaller and smaller. Yeah? So it will just decrease the E. So you see that actually dividing by two to the power of 24 will get me a very nice equidistributed set of floating point numbers. And the large numbers, they will use up all floating point number values. The smaller numbers then have some gaps. Yeah, okay, the C will jump in steps of two for the next level, in steps of four for the next level. Yeah, because we have more numbers in the lower region, but we use an equi distribution for the, for the set. There's also a nice uh, little remark in the documentation. Yeah, so. If you go to the Java documentation, you see that the guys that wrote this mentioned that in earlier versions, they were using here a 30, 30 bit integer and they were dividing by two to the power of 30. And this looks equivalent or it looks even better because you are using um, a much larger number but the thing is that while this method here is giving you exactly a floating point number and there's no rounding involved, this thing here would perform a rounding 
because sometimes we lie in between a floating point number. And you remember that this rounding has a special property. Yeah? So for example, odd guys are rounded up, even guys are rounded down or vice versa. I don't remember. But this non-uniformity gives us then um, a bias yeah, um, in the rounding of the floating point numbers. No, or very subtle thing, or maybe a nice little uh, little anecdote. Okay, so that's how the guy is implemented for the method next double. Actually, um, my random number generator, if I would like to generate now a floating point double value, my random number generator only generates 48 bits, cutting off the lower part is 32 bits. So for the floating point double, I would need more. So I take two random numbers. One is 26 bit, the other is 27. And I combine them to a 53 bit um, integer. And I divide by two to the power of 53. The P is 52, Yeah, also the same, same idea. So if you go back here and have a look at how the floating point double is generated, he is actually taking first 26 bit, then shifting this to the left and then filling up 27 bits on the bottom. So he has 53 bits and then he's just divided by two to the power of 53. And again, that in an earlier version, they did it actually not in the best way. Okay, so sometimes it's nice to, to read a little bit this uh, documentation, how they, how they do it. Okay, so here on the slides, yeah, you find a small example, take um, a random number generator sequence, like the one uh, we have built in and generate a random vector in two dimensions. Well, I have a little code that does this and maybe you can play around with this little code. So it's here in our lecture repository. There's the random vector plot. So I have a loop over say 1000 sample points. And then I take the first random number is my X component. The second random number is my Y component. And I'm creating an X, Y scatter plot uh, of these uh, vectors. Yeah, And if you run this guy, um, He will generate here this, this picture. No? So now random points in two dimensions. So you have this, this picture here and you see it's pseudo random. Yeah, Sometimes we observe gaps here. Sometimes we observe clusters. It's um, random. We will come back in the next session to this. Uh, I would like to conclude with a small comment on the random number generator seed, because the seed is actually important uh, for us. So the seed of the generator, if you think of the linear concurrential generator, it's like the initial value. So the seed specifies the initial value of the sequence. Well, it is not the first value for all get generators because for example, the Mertzen twister is actually generating out of the seed other random numbers, which then define the initial value of the generator. But the important thing is that the seed determines the sequence. So this means if you take the same seed, it will generate the same sequence. And this is important for us because sometimes we would like to test something and I would like to have something that is reproducible. Also, maybe the other property is nice. Um, if you take different seed, it will generate different sequences. So maybe this is nice to, to generate two different Monte Carlo approximations on different computers with different seeds and then average them. Uh, the issue is that it's not guaranteed that the sequence with two different seeds is very nicely independent. Yeah? It could be, if you think of it being the initial value, it could be just a shift, a small shift of the other sequence. So um, note, this is an important remark. Yeah? Note that it is not 
guaranteed that two sequences with different seeds are good representation of an independent component of a vector. Yeah? So two different sequences um, with two different seeds to generate a vector is maybe not a good idea. Maybe I take a minute more on the seed and we go back to our little programming exercise from the last session. We had here our Monte Carlo integrator and you saw that here I already specified use mes and twister. It was a black box when we did it, but now we know it's a random number generator. And the argument here is the seed. So if I go now to our test class, we were testing this and if I specify here the seed, so let's maybe specify the seed. I can maybe play a little bit with the seed. So now for the seed, I would like to have um, a random number generator. The random number generator was our double supplier for the streams. And you can add here the seed to this guy. And then I can add this as the first argument. And you see that um, I can now use this random number generator with this uh, seed to perform the calculation. Actually, this is just the same calculation as we did last time. So we should get uh, the same result. Okay, so, and I also added here a small test. Yeah, so uh, this is a unit test, so you can add an assertion. So the test should only be then be successful if the difference of the um, Monte Carlo integral and the analytic value is below the tolerance. And the tolerance is say three divided by square root of number of evaluation points. That's roughly a little bit more than the Monte Carlo convergence rate. Well, I. Uh, there is anyway a constant here, but I choose a three. So you see the test is okay. Yeah, I have 1000 points. Yeah, I would expect maybe an O point, uh, yeah, say one yeah, or, um, as, a con uh, as an error, I'm, I'm far better. So now if I run this again, you see that we get always the same result. Yeah, so our error is 0 0.004. If I run it again, I get always the same result. So this is nice. The result is reproducible. If I choose here a different seed, 5151, so then I get a different result. Yeah, so now the error is 0017. And also note that my result, my convergence holds only in probability. This may mean that there are some seeds that give me bad results. Uh, I tried an example. For example, if I change here the integration bound to from zero to five, so my cosine is a little bit more wiggling. You know? So then you can maybe try this out. So I use 1000 points and I use my original seed. And okay. That one is already failing. Take a seed of 58. That one is not failing, okay? So this one has an error of 0 0.3. Take a 59. This one is failing. Take a 60. This one is not failing, okay? So failing in terms of my tolerance, well, maybe the tolerance is okay. I just wanted to show you that the error is sometimes outside this bound, sometimes inside this, this bound, depending on uh, my seat. And this is also maybe illustrating a little bit the probabilistic nature, yeah? Different seat, different sequence, different result. That was it for today.